Three rings for the elven kings under the sky. Seven for the dwarf lords in their halls of stone. Nine for mortal men doomed to die. One for the dark lord on his dark throne. If you're familiar with the Lord of the Rings, you're familiar with that poem. It was uh, sort of the story of, uh, well, sort of this background to the whole thing, the whole epic, the, the, the Rings of Power. Uh, it was originally written in Elvish, which I don't speak, but I hear that Tolkien himself spoke it fluently. He invented a language and spoke it fluently. Um, but really, the only point that I'd like to make here is the fact that it was written in Elvish, and the elves are immortal, and they found found it necessary to point out that mortal men are doomed to die. That's what sticks out about them among, you know, in the elvish mind. The dwarves live in their halls of stone. They live underground, um, wonderful hewn kingdoms underground, hewn out of the rock. Mortal men die. That is our fate. That is life. That's what we are. Know thyself become what you are. Now, the Lord of the Rings dealt with ideas like mortality and immortality. Um, in the story of um, Aragorn and Arwen, which is actually the story of Baron and Luthien from the Silmarillion, I think, um, it's implied that immortality is in many ways a curse, and that mortality makes life that much more precious and that much more beautiful. Um, the movie, the original movie of um, the second one, The Two Towers, said that the, it sort of implied that here are these humans, from the elvish point of view, here are these humans who only live and die in the blink of an eye and they are willing to stand and fight. They have these puny, stupid little lives and yet look at the bravery that they're capable of. And it kind of shamed the elves into coming to the aid of the humans um, because again that's kind of the emphasis on uh, in, in the Lord of the Rings um, men humans, the peoples of Gondor and uh, Rohan, they might be mortal, they might get diseases they might get deformities which elves don't get, but they stand and they fight for their stupid little lives and in some way that makes them enormously admirable in the eyes of the elves um, and, of course, in the story of Baron and Luthien, Aragorn Arwen, we know that um, Luthien, or Arwen, chose a mortal life. Why? Because, in a way, it was preferable. In the story, it's implied that, um, we, um, that, that she simply doesn't want to outlive her great love. But, again, throughout the novels, the books, whatever, the, the entire epic, it's implied that the world is wonderful, but we don't want to be here absolutely forever because that will take away from how wonderful it is. Uh, in other words, mortality is a curse. Yes, we will die. Everything will be swept away eventually. But the very fact that it's impermanent makes it that much more precious. The men will stand and fight for their stupid, sordid little lives. Compared to the elves, they have sordid lives. But that in and of itself makes them extremely admirable. And at least in the eyes of the elves. And credit where credit due. And they say, okay, I get it. You, you humans have something that we don't have. And that's some kind of um, humility. That say, okay, we, we, we have very little in this life, but what we do have, we, we prize enormously and we will die for it. Um, what does an elf have that's so wonderful that he's willing to die for is the implication. So, <clears throat> we're caught in mortality. I'm caught in this, as I implied in the previous video, this sheath of karma, of action, of my past, of my future or my view of the past and the future, how all my experiences have shaped my personality, shaped my character, shaped my point of view, everything. Everything that I have ever done or had done to me or experienced or thought about has had its effect on shaping me. This creates a sense of burden which can seem almost unsupportable. 
you think, oh my God, we are well and truly trapped by the phenomenal universe. Um, and in that sense, the Jain view, i.e. we are non-matter, um, or we have souls or minds or whatever um, that is encased in this vast physicality which we call reality. Um, it can horrify you when you think about it. But when you look at it from another perspective, from the point of view of elves looking at men and admiring what they see, men with bad breath, teeth missing, war wounds, diseases, hunger, all this kind of thing, all the sordidness of being human. And yet, as an elf, you see what men will do to continue their enjoyment of this life. Yes, they do enjoy their lives. It sounds crazy from an elvish point of view that these people are satisfied with so little, but they are satisfied, or they are willing to fight for so little, lay their lives down for almost nothing, but they're still willing to lay their lives down for it. So there is something to be gained from our very entrapment, our very entombment in karma. The very fact that we recognize how small we are, and how puny we are, and how helpless, helpless we are, is in its own sense liberating. Um, and our stubborn clinging to our vanities, to our stupidities, to our imperfections, is in its own strange way admirable, if you look at it from a certain point of view. In other words, you look at it from the point of view of someone who is the opposite. Elves are ideal humans, perfect humans. Um, whereas humans in The Lord of the Rings are particularly flawed. <laughs> so, the humans in The Lord of the Rings kind of ride the tiger. We know that this is all vain. We know that this is all pointless. We are mortal. Every last one of us will die. We know this. And yet, we will stand and fight for this stupid little existence that we have riding the tiger. Yes, I know that karma is gigantic. Yes, I know that it's huge. But in a sense, it makes me so small that that little tiny bit that I do have tastes so much better because I know it's fleeting. Um, so in a sense, our mortality is a liberating thing. Um, whatever we suffer will it one day be abolished. Also, whatever we do, whatever good we do, will also be abolished. But our experiences will be real while we're having them. Um, this, if you ask me, is where spirituality and the material, phenomenal universe coincide quite nicely. Living your stupid little life, knowing that it's pointless, knowing that it's useless, knowing that it's that, that you're that value that you get out of it is so fleeting can can serve to cheapen how how little or it can serve to cheapen our life in a certain way but it can also liberate us when we know that in a certain sense we're so small in in the face of the cosmos why should we worry about anything we're you know gnothi say auto know thyself know how limited you are and how in the grand scheme of things unimportant you are. If you're unimportant, then you can stop worrying so much about the horrors of the world. There's only so much a human being can do about it. Um, and you can also take solace from the fact that, okay, I understand that the universe is vast. I understand that I can conceive of some sort of perfection out there, but I may not ever reach it. Um, Petr Vessel Sofe said that humans had overshot themselves in the revolution. In other words, we can conceive of a wonderful, wonderful thing, but we do not have the capacity to actually achieve that. We can conceive of perfection, but we can't achieve it. Now what? Well, his response was that, well, we 
stop having babies. <laughs> um, well, that's nice. And there's plenty of that. The Janes believe that. Um, but the Janes are realistic enough to know that there will always be a universe there and there will always be human beings, so there's really not, not a lot of point of going down that road. But if that's what suits you, by all means, do that. Um, ride the tiger. Understand your limitations. Know thyself. Know that you're a mortal man doomed to die and you will never reach perfection, at least in as things stand now. You can move a little bit towards perfection, and a degree of humility can help you. Um, although humility is a tricky thing, because humility can be massively abused. Um, when someone else demands that you show some humility, that's the priest. That is in Mendham. He demands everyone else shows humility, and he denounces anyone who dares to defy his demands for humility. Um, that's the Old Testament prophet who denounces people for their vanities, for their stupidities, for their puniness, and not living up to God, all that kind of thing that you read in the Old Testament. Um, you read that actually in the Vedas as well, when you um, read about gods like Rudra, who are demanding wrathful titans. <laughs> um, but the, you know, the new super gods that superseded the old Vedic gods, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, particularly Vishnu and Shiva, said, wait a minute, you're only human. You can only do so much here. Um, I'm God. I know that I'm sort of an elf here. I'm immortal. I'm perfect. I'm flawless. I'm blemishless. I know that you're a human. You're small and imperfect. I'm not like an Old Testament prophet where I will hate you for your, for your imperfections. I accept that. Because, you know, in, I know that one can only be what one is. I can't expect a human to be more than a human. So, <clears throat> within the boundaries set by us being mortal men doomed to die, or in the Indic sense, humans hopelessly caught up in the wheel of existence, there is room for maneuver here. There is room for improvement. There is room for enjoyment. There is room for progress, a sense of accomplishment, even in the full knowledge that I will die, my DNA will one day die, and the species of which I am a member will one day be extinct. Um, that's just the way the universe is. <clears throat> I am imperfect. That's just the way of things. Now, I mentioned before I do yoga. <clears throat> well, this is the Muladhara Chakra. Okay, I, I painted that myself. I'm a amateur artist, very bad artist. Um, but you know, if, I can play with colors and you know, like stuff like this. And the Muladhara Chakra is the root chakra. It's the lowest chakra in Hatha Yoga, where you have to stabilize that chakra before you can do anything. And in fact, it's kind of like a, a a chakra that's not like the other chakras in that. It's simply the lowest, the bare minimum before you can make any progress at all. Before you stabilize the Muladhara Chakra, you're stuck or you're just flying all over the place, willy-nilly. Uh, your mind, your body, everything is completely out of your control. You have to stabilize that chakra, the part of your body that is you know, between your upper thighs and your waist. Um, there's all kinds of mumbo-jumbo surrounding that, but... When it comes to actually stabilizing your body and getting your body to relax, it's been my experience that that's what I have to do. I have to stabilize that chakra, if I want to call it a chakra. That is sort of the, the, the hub of all the spokes in my body. Um, it's, you know, the, you know, the metaphor of the wheel. You know, the, there's, the, there's the axle and then there's the spokes going outward. That's sort of the axle. I spend a lot of my meditation, attempting to concentrate on that part of my body to stabilize it, to get it to completely and utterly relax, and for me to think of only that part of the body. At the same time, though, you got to sort of, every so often, your, your mind has to go off to different parts of your body because a part is seizing up or it's getting, 
cramped or um, or it's just it just gets jumpy so it wants to move but always you bring your consciousness back to that part of your body and when you say that part of your body that's a mental space as much as a physical space there's all kinds of thoughts that are associated with that part of your body sexual thoughts uh, things like that um, but it is very much a cerebral thing even though you're dealing with that which is below the belt <clears throat> I do Hatha yoga I do yoga I don't have a guru I don't even go to yoga classes or anything like that I'm self-taught I'll probably always be that way but for whatever reason I've set that goal for my entire life to stabilize the Muladhara chakra it, it, it doesn't matter if you believe in that chakra or not I use it just as a metaphor for that part of my body that is the absolute minimum when you're trying to control your body and control your mind I find even you have to have that part calmed down in your body in the grand scheme of things when you know everything there is you know or if, when you know the vastness of the phenomenon of yoga or Vedanta or spiritualism or anything anything you want to call that um, that seems pretty puny wanting to stabilize the lowest possible chakra how very you know there's there's ecstasy at the top you'll get mind-blowing uh, experiences the higher you get I understand that I'm a mortal man I know my limitations or at least I think I do I intuit my limitations and if I I think now if I with my dying thought I go yep I got somewhere in that life in this life or whatever um, I have no idea what comes afterwards I could be simply snuffed out of existence I don't know um, or I could pass on to some other state I don't know nobody knows but I think that if I have stabilized that, that part of my body, mind, spirit, whatever you want to call it, I will have a sense of accomplishment, however puny that is. Even though I am mortal, I have to brush my teeth or my breath stinks, I have to take a shit or else, you know, I get health problems or whatever, I have to eat food, I have to do all kinds of things that are seem hopelessly mundane. I have to deal with irritating people at my job. Life seems in many ways one big pain in the ass a lot of the time. But if I make the amount of progress that I've realistically or I believe I've realistically set for myself by um, stabilizing this and there is a certain degree of arrogance in that and a certain degree of humility in that if I if I accomplish that I believe I will have accomplished enough in this life I think I think that that's how I'm gonna feel later on in life I don't know but it looks that way to me the humility is necessary because you sort of say you will never achieve enlightenment in this life or whatever you want to call it um, isolation um, Samadhi integration whatever but you'll get a little bit closer is that something is that worth all the other stuff I say it is can anyone else tell me that I'm wrong can anyone else say that that's a stupid goal can an elf really say to a human being it's you're an idiot for standing there and fighting and dying in front of Helm's Deep for an army of orcs when in the normal scheme of things you're simply gonna die anyway how stupid but the elves were wise they saw that they saw that the puny goals of men were in an oblique way admirable lovable and even in a certain sense enviable in the Silmarillion Luthien, in some ways, wanted to become mortal because she didn't want to live on after Baron had died because he was a mortal human. She loved him intensely. But also, it's implied that she saw the beauty of mortality and the beauty of imperfection, the beauty of all the 
crap that humans have to deal with. Um, the base stuff that elves simply are not subject to. This is kind of Nietzschean as well. Um, that just being in existence is in of itself an exalted state. It's wonderful to be alive. And, and the fact that we know that we're mortal makes it even more wonderful. Um, that's simply a point of view that I wouldn't push on anyone else. But it is an interesting view of karma and a way of riding the tiger. Understanding the vastness, the unbelievable vastness of the cosmos, and especially the wheel of existence, and how small we are in the grand scheme of that, is very, very, very useful and liberating, say the Indic faiths or philosophies. Just understanding what you are and beginning a tiny little search towards the good is valuable, admirable, and wonderful in and of itself. Um, I'm not saying that I that this is an idea I would um, espouse to anyone. I'm merely explaining a point of view as opposed to saying that this is the way to live. Again, in our Western view of things, with our either-or, um, it's this... It, you know, either this applies to everybody, or it's irrelevant, or, it, or it, it, it's meaningless. But I don't see it that way at all. Um, I see it as what an individual needs based upon his or her experience. Um, and again, the, Ind the Indic view of thing, things is, we all have our own individual karmic burden, and we all have to approach it in our own way. Some of us have very little, some of us have a lot of karma. And the only person who knows that, and many of us don't even know that, but the only person who can even come close to understanding it is the individual, his or herself. Only the person who is actually experiencing an experience knows what that experience is. Only someone who has been through something grasps it. Only someone who has a specific combination and amount of karma or of experience accumulated in their life grasps, or can grasp even, what is necessary to deal with it. Um, know thyself. Know what you are. The next thing is, I guess, Dharma. Phone's ringing.